Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's uh, presentation on what's new in Microsoft Dynamics GP 18.6, also known as GP 2024. Uh, kind of like the new model year of a car, it comes out in the fall, and uh, we're actively uh, upgrading and working with clients to uh, get everything running in the new year. Let me uh, continue on. First of all, happy birthday, Dynamics GP. Uh, now 31 years old, uh, originally Great Plains, and uh, very excited that GP is still going strong uh, and has a roadmap to 2028 and beyond. Talking about the roadmap, here it is. So we had the fixed life cycle for Dynamics GP, and then Microsoft changed the naming convention and some of the uh, back-end modern life cycle aspects. And that includes an annual release every single year to 2028 and beyond. Uh, we're eagerly awaiting for 2029, 2030, and what that brings. Uh, right now, uh, the official release is what we see here uh, on the screen. Those that are on Dynamics GP 2013, 2015, 2016, 2018, Endeavor and our GP support North team will still support you till the end of time. However, to be officially supported by Microsoft, you need to be doing the upgrades, move on to modern life cycle, and uh, each year provides additional small patches that uh, bring you up to the most recent version. So, our agenda, as I mentioned, we love Dynamics GP. We feel a safe and a strong application to stay with. Uh, I'm going to go to quickly talk about uh, client survey and how uh, some of your peers have responded. Uh, a little bit on Dynamics GP technical, and then moving over to Marvin, uh, who is our uh, superstar for today. And I know you guys are all wanting to hear uh, his points of view on Microsoft Dynamics GP and how we can um, be able to support you and you can support your team uh, for years to come. So, survey. We did a survey in uh, November of 2023, had uh, sent it out to all 550 of our GP clients. Uh, shame on you if you didn't respond. And for those that did respond, thank you very much for your input. Uh, we're looking to do another one this spring, so please stay attuned. Uh, those that receive our webinar invites, those who receive our monthly GP newsletter, will include links and a call to action for there. So. Of our clients that responded, 82% want to stay on GP for as long as they can. Uh, our official question is, do you plan to stay on GP for the next three years or more? And 82% said yes. Of those that are staying on GP, basically of that 82%, so we have a percentage of percent, more than half want to improve their analytics and reporting. Maybe extend that to cloud-based reporting for easier access looking at budgeting and forecasting, automation, and third-party tools. Interesting, 14% still want to have integrations to their CRM. Endeavor does a great job in integrating to the Microsoft Dynamics 365 CRM platform. And we've also integrated for a number of clients that are using Salesforce.com. AP automation is a hot topic and continues to be so, uh, both with cloud automation as well as post-pandemic with half your finance team or more. Uh, working from remote offices or from a home office. As well, the AP automation tools are way better than they were in the past. Pricing has come down significantly. Functionality and usability has gone up in exponentially, as well as the OCR capabilities, which is the basic machine learning, AI, whatever you want to call it, ability to read PDFs that are emailed to you or scanned from uh, paper moved into the system and pre-populating all the fields that your team needs. GP training, 25% of clients looking for more training, more modules, basically optimizing uh, your Dynamics GP. If we think of all the reporting above, you know, have, if you consider that to be optimizing and getting more of your system, it really is those who want to stay on GP are looking to, how can I get more, how can I do integration? Uh, and the last point here, 45%, almost half, want to start using more with their email uh, for billing and Office 365. And Marvin uh, hopefully will talk about that 
uh, later on today. Technical updates. So upgrades. The main thing to know, the system requirements really haven't changed much from last year. There's support for Windows 11, all the new Windows servers, and 18.6, which is the current most recent version, does drop compatibility for SQL Server 2014. On an official basis, I'm using quotes here, um, you would have to work with our uh, technical team to figure out where that line is actually drawn. SQL Server 2019, um, that's obviously four plus years old now. It stopped using VBA for custom applications. So what that means is if you are doing an upgrade and want to update to your SQL Server and Windows Server, then you need to be conscious of what versions you're using on. And if you have VBA for custom applications, uh, then those have to be rewritten. So how to upgrade. If you're on the modern life cycle, anytime you add the patch for your year-end or payroll updates for those few clients that are using Canadian payroll, that gets you there. If you move from 18.3 to 18.4 to 18.5, any of those individual points are often considered an in-place update. Some clients you do it in a full test environment, some wing it and just put it through as if it's a patch and that reduces the cost and efforts. And we are recommending the clients, uh, if they can, consider updating every year or two compared to in the past where it was sort of every three to five years. The traditional upgrades, obviously still a function and especially if you're on any one of the older fixed life cycles, um, so 2013, 2010, 2015, 2016, uh, it is a bigger hump, a uh, bigger jump, and you have to get over that hump to uh, move into the new modern life cycle, and uh, that would be a full test upgrade followed by a second upgrade into production environment. And again, we have a whole team of experts that are doing this, uh, given our client volume, uh, we're teeing them all up and helping you get the most out of your systems. So. That's it for the sales and marketing introduction. Thank you for your time. I'm going to pass this over to Marvin. Uh, Marvin, introduce yourself and then we'll turn off our camera so you can uh, share your screen and provide greater real estate. And I'll come back in at the end for our wrap up. Perfect. So Scott, if you want to throw it over to my screen, that would be great. So I'm Marvin Burnett. Um, I've been Oh, sorry, Scott, I'm just going to, oh, which screen can you see, Scott? The black one, Windows Server 2012. Perfect. All right, so that's my GP server that I'm working on. So <clears throat> a quick uh, little note about myself. Uh, I'm Marvin Burnett. I'm one of the directors here at Endeavor Solution. Uh, more so, when Scott pulled up that happy birthday GP, 31 years, um, it made me feel like this gray has become well-deserved because I started using GP in 1996. So that puts me officially old, I think, um, or uh, have a fair bit of experience inside the GP world, uh, I guess one or the other. Um, a couple other things, uh, I've been working in GP for a number of years, worked as a number of different roles, worked on a number of projects. I think I'm probably sitting on around, I don't know, three to 400 different implementations over the years. So um, it's, been, uh, it's been pretty awesome. I've gotten to know a lot of people. And in the process, I've gotten to see a lot of the changes and a lot of the stuff that's been added into the system, as well I've been able to uh, be very fortunate to work with a wonderful team here at Endeavor because not only have I seen a lot of different implementations, but I also get to see a lot of different ways that people can do different things. So as we're going through some of the upgrade points today, um, you know, I'll, I'll try to add some uh, flair or inflection around some of the stuff that I've also seen. So whether it's been uh, just in my journey throughout the years or whether it's been with uh, some of the other employees here that have shared with me because I always say as I keep, uh, as I meet with different people, whether it's Brittany or Adam or, you know, anyone on the team, it's I'm always amazed at all the different things. It's like, oh man, I didn't realize you could do that. So I'm always constantly learning, um, which is great, which is also part of the reason why we're working on uh, the what's new today. So let me just start by, uh, I'm going to turn off my camera so you guys can get a little bit more screen. And Scott, is my camera turned off? Yes, it is. I'm turning off mine as well. 
not quite as used to go to meeting. I'm using Teams more often, so it's a little bit different for myself. So, all right, so I've got GP. I've got the latest version of GP installed here. So I'm just going to pop open GP. Uh, a couple things that I want to just talk about before we dive into some of the what new what's new features. So there's a number of uh, what's new uh, features and functions that have been added into the system. Don't think I'd have enough time today if I were to jump into all of them. So sort of working with the rest of the team and going through the list myself, we've kind of picked out a couple highlight ones that we want to touch on. Uh, plus, as I go through these, I'm going to touch on a couple other things that have built up to this upgrade. So if these features have been added, uh, in previous versions than now, how have they enhanced them? That's one of the things that I want to touch on today. Um, as well, in around, you know, what is happening in GP? So from the standpoint of upgrades, what I've been seeing in the, the last couple of upgrades is that they're really heavily focused around compliance and requested feature updates. So when I say compliance, that's just meaning, uh, in my mind, I always see that as dealing with security and compatibility. So, for example, you know, many of the people on this call, they've probably experienced the pain points that have come around the that multi-factor authentication or the MFA piece. I think if you were on something, uh, I think, Scott, your little note there showed uh, prior to 18.3, you probably felt the pain of multi-factor authentication. I'm first going to start by saying MFA is not a Microsoft thing, so it's not Microsoft's fault that multi-factor authentication got implemented. It's more designed to protect the information um, as a whole on a wide variety of applications. I know when I go into my banking software, I have to use multi-factor authentication there. So what it's showing is that Microsoft is staying ahead with its updates around the application. It wants to make sure, or they want to make sure that um, when new uh, Windows versions, SQL versions, um, Windows Server versions are coming out, that you know your mission, or not mission critical, but your application uh, critical or your critical applications to your business are staying uh, up to date with that. So that's one of the reasons, you know, um, I've mentioned the compliance piece. Now the feature update, so I'm just going to log into uh, GP right now. So the feature update is most requested features. So GP itself is a, um, a feature rich application. Uh, what that means is for the enhancements, Microsoft is actually looking out to the user base to get suggestions. Now, I know we've done these uh, what's new updates in the past, and I keep going back to this list, the experience.microsoft or experience.dynamics.com. Uh, this is actually a page that you can go to, and you can either input your request to say, I would love to see this feature, or you can scan through different features inside here and vote for them. So it's as simple as just clicking on vote as you go through these. And if you like the feature, vote for it. This is what Microsoft's looking at. So as we're going through some of the features today, you'll be like, yeah, that's a pain. Why didn't it ever get put in? Well, maybe the developers didn't know about it until somebody you know, put in a request to do that and voted on it. So I strongly recommend that you guys vote on the feature updates. Or if there's things that you, uh, you know, I wish it did this, you know, reach out to our team, see if it does do it, because maybe it is there and you just don't realize it. Or put in a request for it to do it. And then even internally, we do this all the time, and we'll send out e emails internally to say, guys, you know, there's 100 employees at Endeavor, vote for this feature. Let's get these features put in place because we know the value of it for the different people. So I'm just going to go over to GP now. So Scott, just a quick uh, check. Can you see GP on my screen? Yes, I can. Awesome. So one of the first things uh, that I'm going to touch on is a little bit around the viewing and the accessibility of information and some of the features around you know the enhancement on some of the inquiry screen inquiry screens so one of the first things i'm going to go is it's one of the features that was released earlier in terms of the viewing so if i go under the customer here for example or if i'm doing a customer inquiry so this is one that came out earlier but it's going to build on one of the features that have come out is if I'm going transaction by customer. So I'm going to pick up Aaron Fitz here. He's my favorite customer because he is the second one on the list. Uh, inside here, you know, maybe I want to start looking at some of the documents. Well, as I scroll through here, one of the things that people always say, like, why is it sorted in this manner? Well, the easy thing to say is, well, you know what, on one of the new releases, you can actually change the sort option. So maybe I want to change it to document date. And I don't want it to go from oldest to newest. I want it to go from newest to oldest. So I'm just going to take a quick change on my screen here. And now I've got the newest documents up at the top and the oldest documents at the bottom. 
I like this view. I'm just going to save this as my Windows preference. This is a great little feature that came out. I think it was the last build that it came out on. This is a fantastic little feature um, that I can drill into this now and see the document, or I can click on my all-in-one view. Now, my all-in-one view is simply saying, where has this document been and where through its journey can you find it? Now, if I wanted to increase the visibility of documents, because I know Aaron Fitz actually has more than this many documents on their account, I can say, show me all my open and historical orders, right? Now, I can also say, SOP contains. So this is one of the things that I really like, the fact that we can do a contain search rather than a left to right search. So I can go 2308, because this is just easy enough. One of the documents that, and I can add the additional options here, I can just simply click on OK. Now I'm seeing in my orders it's brought into Focus 2308. So when I click on this, I now have an all-in-one view of this order became this invoice, which had this payment on it. So that is one of the things with the additional filters and the views here to do a little bit more searching on it. And it's great that we have the ability to drill down into the information and find it easily. The next thing that I want to touch on is how they've updated the view on the financial summary. So I'm just going to switch over my area page. So this is my area page here. This is my navigation list and my navigation pane over on the left-hand side. I can move around my screen. So if I wanted inquiry up here, if I wanted to move cards, I could easily move these around. I'm just going to go into my inquiry screen. So one of the updates on this feature was the ability to actually re-display the view as you switch different GL accounts, or as you switch between years, or as you switch between the different functional areas that you're looking at on this. So if I pick up 1113 and 00, my cash bank Canada, what you can see here is I have the ability to change this. Now in previous versions, if I wanted to change to a different GL account or something, I basically had to either scroll through these or I had to close out of the window and open up the window again. So as I drilled back on this, I have that drill back functionality. I also have the ability to drill back down into historical years. So if 2018 or 2019, I have the historical years right on the screen. But if I wanted to go to another account, I can just easily pick up another account. And then rather than having to close out and go back in, I just hit redisplay, and that's going to bring up the information for that other account. Let me see if oh, it's got some information in that here. So pretty easy on that basis. I have the ability to uh, redisplay on that account number. So that's a great little feature. Um, I know from the standpoint of having worked in GP for so long, the fact that you had to bump ahead, bump back, move forward, move back, whatever, close the window, open the window again, it was an incredible pain. So just little things like this. This is an example of I'm going back to the you know vote on features or ask like. It's been one of those things over the years, like, why can you not just redisplay this window? Somebody said, well, rather than ask, you know, or think to that to myself, I'm going to put it down as a suggestion. Microsoft got enough votes, and they actually put this in as one of the feature releases. All right. This actually, because I'm on the financial piece, I might as well jump over to the next feature release, um, which is dealing with the year-end close. So couple of things, and this is probably, you know, a, a relevant topic for a number of the people on the call today because we're in February right now, so you've probably either just gone through a year-end, if your year-end's December 31st, or you're getting prepared to do your year-end or something along those lines. Now, inside GP, um, you have the ability to do year-end close. That's pretty obvious. I'm sure a lot of the people here have been using GP for a while. So under the routines, I just have the year-end closing function here. Now, there are scenarios as I'm doing the year-end close that I may have to um, fix entries or fix adjustments, uh, which means I have to either excuse me, reopen the year for some reason or reverse the year-end close. So a couple of years ago, they introduced the concept of reverse the historical year. What that means is if I do a year-end close, and I didn't mean to do the year-end close, um, I can always just hit the reverse historical year, and what it's going to do is reopen the year. So it's just going to reverse any of the entries and put the account, or put the 2020 or 20 or 2019, for example, uh, back as an open year. Now, why would you want to reverse a year-end close? Well, there's been a couple scenarios over the year that I've seen. One that's very infrequent is uh, if I close a year, 
GP will allow me to post transactions one closed year back, but not two. So maybe you guys got new auditors or something like that. There was a discrepancy, a material discrepancy that was found, and you have to put the transaction back two years. Well, without the reverse year-end close, it doesn't give you the ability to do that. Another uh, reason is, for example, when I do a year-end close, it's going to take all my balance sheet accounts and create balance brought forwards. At the same time, it's going to take all my P&L accounts and close them out to my retained earnings. So if, for example, I tagged a GL account incorrectly, I would want to reverse the year, correct the account, reclose the year, and it's going to close it off to the retained earnings properly or bring it as a balance brought forward. So that would be another reason that you may want to close a year. Or something that I've actually seen happen, I think last year uh, myself, I worked on I think three different support cases where a company had actually realigned their year. So they either declared a stub year or they declared an extended year. So let's say your year ended in September, but you realigned the year and said we have a now a new year end of December. And what ends up happening is when you realign the year, you can extend the year to be 15 months or you can shorten it to be nine months, so you could do a stub year or a long year. Uh, but what it doesn't let you do is renumber the years. So you can't do like a 2021A or a 2021, uh, well, I guess 2021, 2021A, 2022, so on and so forth. So what that's going to do is if I realign it, you may find that the year number doesn't really align with the years themselves. So what you could do is you could reopen the previous years. You could renumber them like renumber the uh, dates inside the uh, calendar, and then reclose the year. So these are a couple of reasons why the reverse year-end close is great. Now, what's the new feature on this? So the reverse year-end close has been around for a long time. The new feature is the fact that in the previous, in previous versions, if you wanted to reverse or reopen a year, you had to make sure everybody was outside of GP, or everybody was out of GP. So you'd have to, all right, guys, I'm going to request a service outage. Everybody get out of GP, regardless of what company you're in. So what the new feature is, is you don't have to get everybody out of GP, but you do have to have exclusive access to that one company. So people can be working in the other company still, but they don't have to be um, out of GP altogether. So it's less intrusive around um, if you ever had to do that year-end close or reverse the year-end close. One little note, as I was going through this with one of the people I work with, they said, Marvin, maybe you should touch on the, because it's so close to year end, a few things that people do around year end. Um, and one of the big things is, I'm going to go into my smart list here for a second. So if we're talking about year end, I'm going to just touch on my financial here. And under accounts, you'll see that I have a year end validation. I mentioned that when you do the year end, balance sheet accounts close to, you know, uh, or have a balance brought forward created. P&L accounts or profit and loss accounts will close out to my retained earnings. I always recommend that you want to run your year-end close after you get a substantial number of the transactions in for that first month, but before you have to run your financials for the first month because you want those balance brought forwards created so your balance sheet is now going to look proper. Um, just to do this, I always recommend if you're doing a year-end close, always do a quick search where maybe I have my main segment is let me just say 4,000. All my assets and uh, assets, liabilities, and equities are ones, twos, and threes, and my P&L accounts are 4,000 and greater. So I may say is uh, less than here, and my posting type, because I want to see ones that are exceptions. Maybe I'm going to say are, are profit and loss accounts. So every, inside my list, every one of my balance sheet accounts is set up properly, but when I reverse my search and say is greater than, 39.99 and my posting type is equal to balance sheet. So I know that these really should be profit and loss accounts. It's going to show me a list of, oh, hey, Marvin, you got 16 accounts that are tagged incorrectly. Well, easily enough, I can just double click on one of these, go, no, this is supposed to be profit and loss, save, close out of this. And I'm just going to do a quick refresh on this. So when I hit refresh here, you're going to see that my account list turns to 15. Why? I fixed up one of the accounts. Hopefully when you run this, you don't have any of them that are showing incorrect, but it is a nice little check to do before you do your year-end close. So this isn't one of the features, but because we're so close to year-end, I figured it's probably a good time to just mention it. But the year-end close and that reverse year-end close and not have everybody kicked out of the system, that's the new feature. All righty. The next thing is that I'm going to jump over to is going to align more with uh, customers customers and customer statements. 
This feature I actually love because over the years, this one's come up over and over and over again. So when I go into my routines, so I'm just going to go, all right, where's my routine? So I'm just going to go click on my sales area page. I'm going to go into my statements here. On my statements, I have the ability to set up statements that I want, right? So maybe I have monthly statements here or Aaron Fitz. I've done one specific statement for Aaron Fitz, my biggest customer, so I'm sending them out statements often. The feature that was added here is actually the ability to exclude all fully applied documents. So what does this mean? In previous versions, if you wanted to exclude the fully applied documents, you were uh, reliant on doing your paid transaction removal because what it would do is exclude only fully applied payments. So to be able to move all the documents through to history, because my customer statements only look at that open table inside GP, uh, for me to exclude any fully applied documents, I would have to do my pay transaction history. Well, if I don't want to do my pay transaction history, if I hold my control button down, I actually have the ability to say what I want to select. So you'll see here, I'm not holding my control button down, so I've just picked one. But as soon as I hold my control button down on my keyboard, I start saying what I want to exclude. So in this case, I want to exclude fully applied payments, I want to consolidate national accounts, exclude fully applied uh, documents, so all my documents as well. So that gives me the ability to say, all right, great, now I can hit print here. So, okay, so I'm going to print my statement, fantastic. All right, and I got way, well, this, I'm not very good at doing collections on Aaron Fitz because he's got a lot of things outstanding, but you're seeing here I have the ability to generate my statement. At the same time as well, this is going to tie into one of the other features with the multi-factor authentication that came out, plus the fact that we now have the ability to um, tie back a one second, tie back a um, single key tenant for access. When I go back to Aaron Fitz here, I'm going to tie in my email. So if I want to send an email to Aaron Fitz, easily enough, I could have just clicked on email. Now, a couple things are going to happen here. Part of my multi-factor authentication, you can't see me, I'm picking up my phone right now, I guess I could turn on my screen, but I'm actually using this to say, all right, who am I? I'm Marvin, this is my password, so it's authenticating who I am, and to make sure it's really who I am, it's saying, all right, punch in your MFA key here, so my MFA key is 16, so I'll punch that in, and I've just on my phone authenticated that I'm really Marvin. So now it's saying, all right, I'm going to generate an email. However, it's saying something, there were errors sending the statements. Well, what was the error? So first of all, I noticed it was sending a statement to Mary Sue at Endeavor Solutions. There's no Mary Sue at Endeavor Solutions, so it's returned actually an email to me saying, um, Marvin, this person doesn't exist. So if I just pull up my email on the left-hand side here, you can see right here, I'm getting that, hey, this doesn't exist. So I'm actually getting that notification right away saying you've made an error message because there's a delivery error on uh, Mary Sue there. So the second thing that I want to do is go, all right, well, let's take a quick look at the customer. How does it do that? So when I go down to Aaron Fitz here, I'm looking at my email here. I'm seeing, well, I don't even see Mary Sue here. How is it picking up Mary Sue? When I go down to email here, I can see, all right, for my customer statement, PDF, and disable, oh, it's using, because I'm not enabling multiple document types, it's using my bill to statement to. So my statement to is actually on my receivable. So if I go through my addresses here, oh, Mary Sue at Endeavor Solutions. So maybe I'm just going to change that to M Burnett at Endeavor Solutions dot CA or dot com. Either one's going to work. And the other quick thing that I noticed here is, um, I actually spelt my name incorrectly, so let me just go back to the accounts here and primary, so Endeavor Solutions, I spelt Endeavor Solutions wrong, so I'm just going to update that and hit save there. So now that's updated, so if I sent out those statements again, I'm not going to have any issue because it's a real email address that it's going to be sending it out to. All right. So that's on the uh, emailing functionality. So emailing's been around, multi-factor, there's been updates on that side, plus more so if I just go back to that statement side, 
That statement side has been at, or what they've added is this exclude fully applied documents. What that means, don't have to do my paid transaction removal anymore to be able to get the statements that I want to send to the customers. So those open balances and only the open balances for those customers. So the next update that I want to touch on is actually along the lines of uh, the 1099s. So what's a 1099? So a 1099 is a document that you would be uh, presenting to uh, maybe a vendor or it would be a vendor that is doing work for you. 1099s are typically focused on around the uh, US payroll and US vendors that you're working with or uh, US uh, industry. In Canada, it might align with something like a T4A. So in fact, we often have um, clients that we work with um, that are like, well, Marvin, I'm not using Canadian payroll, but I do have vendors that I have to issue T4As for. I want to be able to group them and gather them together. Well, easily enough, if I just go over to my purchasing screen, and if I just go down into my vendor card here, I have the ability to say, you know what, here's one of the vendors, Ace Travel. Under the options here, this is where you can say that they are a either not a 1099, so not a 1099 is the default, but you can pick whether they're non-employee compensation, the standard box. So for those using 1099s, great feature. For those in Canada that are not using 1099s, but they're like, you know what, I've always wondered you know, why that 1099 is there and if I could use it. If you do have to issue T4As, this is a great way to actually create a list because you can do a smart list against anybody that's received compensation that should be a T4A, so you're getting those amounts that you could uh, put onto your T4As or if you're using Ceridian, update them on the Ceridian side or just send them out to your suppliers that you know need that information. Uh, but for those of you that are using 1099s, in previous years, they had the ability to generate 1099s, right? That's been around for a long time. However, every time that you generated it, it prevented a non-graphical form. So one of the things that was updated is the fact that for a non-employee compensation, if I'm picking one wide with box, if I hit print forms here, so we have the 1099 form now being printed as it should look. Now, in the last version, they actually updated the supplier that is the non-employee compensation but in this latest version what they've done is they've actually added the dividend interest in miscellaneous so you could choose any one of these and it's going to now print a graphical form for you that you can send off to your uh, your vendors that should be getting your 1099s so that's a great little feature and once again it's one of those when they rolled it out the first time and only made the non-employee compensation there was a number of requests that went through going, hey guys, why haven't you made this for all of the different forms? And I guess they just didn't think about it. Since they voted on it, people voted on it, they've actually added that functionality. So on the latest build, you'll actually have that laser form that comes out and it's going to look like a um, graphical form rather than just boxes without any lines or uh, fields presented on them. Okay. I'm now going to move over to my navigation list. So as I said, my area page is here, my navigation pane is down here, my navigation list are up here. As I move through the different functional areas, you'll see that the navigation lists update with as I update as I click on them. Now the navigation lists have been around for quite a few years. I find that this is probably one of the few, like one of the features that's most commonly not used in GP. Just because people have been using GP for so long, they're used to going, well, I'm going to go look at transactions by customer, or I'm going to go look at sales documents, or I'm going to look at sales, item, whatever it is, there's different ways that you could look for it, and you just get set into that way that you look for it. Well, what you can also do is you can actually run through this navigation list, and you can click on, for example, the all sales transactions. Now, as you're seeing when I click on it, one of the complaints that people have is it takes a little bit of time for this navigation list to open. Well, the reason that the navigation takes a little bit of time to open is because it's adding these graphics or these business analyzer reports on the left-hand side. You can see as I open up this more, you can see the reports. Now, my personal preference is I tend to turn off these business analyzer reports because I don't use them because they're so small, I can't really read them. And having done this for as I mentioned, 25 years, you know, the eyesight starts to, you know, get a little weaker over time. So what I'm going to do here is just, I'm going to move over here and I'm just going to go Tools, Setup, System, 
I'm going to go down to system preferences here. So this is going to be a preference for what you want. So I'm just going to throw in my password here. One of the enhancements that came out a couple of years ago is it actually remembers when you throw in your password and that uh, system setting. When you exit out, it'll ask you to do it again. But on the bottom of the system preferences, if you prefer not to have the business analyzer reports show up on my navigation list, just remove this check mark. So what you're going to find here is while I'm in my sales, I'm just going to go back to that list again. You're going to see it is substantially faster to pull up. Why? Because it's not trying to render a report. And as I click on that report, it's going to change the visual there. So that's typically why it's going to change. So if you like them, don't turn it off. If you don't like them and you find it's a pain, that system preferences is an easy way to turn them off. So as I'm in this window, you're going to see here, all right, so I, I don't normally use this window, Marvin, but what can I do in it? Well, what you can do is you can actually start filtering down on information. So for example, if I was looking for customers with their last 365 days worth of uh, transactions, I can easily say, all right, well, who am I looking for? I'm going to look for anybody with the word paper in the name. So I've got advanced paper company. I can release that or remove that and I can start filtering or getting everything back for the last 365 days. In this filter here, I can also add filters. So if I just click add filter here, one of the new features that have been coming out is that they've been adding additional uh, search criteria in this where clause. So one of the newest ones is batch source. This is great because if you want to create yourself a custom navigation list, batch source is going to help me say where batch source is equal to maybe I want to do sales entry. So any sales transaction entries that I have, I can just say sales entry and add my filter here. Now you didn't see much change on this one because everything on the screen was actually set to a sales transaction entry. There was more payments and stuff like that down further. So that's an easy way that you can set this up to see all of the transactions. And I can say, well, you know what? Show me all my transactions for Aaron Fitz. So I'm just going to do Aaron Fitz over on the right-hand side do a search, so now I've got everything down to Aaron Fitz and his last 30 days. So now I've got the last 30 days worth of transactions for Aaron Fitz. So nice and easy there. If I wanted to save this, I can easily just go save as, and I can call this Aaron Fitz 30 days. And if I just go OK here, you're going to see that it's actually created a custom Aaron Fitz 30 days. So I can either go back to that all transactions or I can have some quick shortcuts. So some of the features is the fact that we've added the filter and we have that filter so we can go right down. So the filter's always been there, but we've got more options now, including that batch source. You can even add little filters that say, and you know where document type is maybe payments. So I'm just going to do a drop down here. So if I want to see a customer's payments here, I can easily just say, show me all the payments. Now, if I only want to see open payments, I can go and document type where uh, status is open. And then add that filter again. So here's my filter down to open payments for anybody. And if I wanted to pick and just apply this one step further, I can go Aaron Fitz again and add that, you know, Aaron Fitz open payments for the last 10 days. From here as well, if I needed to, so the cash receipt function, I can select on this and I can actually email them to the customer. So the emailing the cash receipts is also a new feature that came out last version. Uh, but it does give us the ability to drill down, take a look, email out, get them out to customers. So once again, if I wanted to, easily enough, we're batch source equals sales entry and I can just uh, filter down there. Uh, instead of filtering here, I should have added Aaron Fitz in this as a constant filter. All right. The next thing that I'm going to go into, and when I saw this come out, I was actually pretty excited about it because I was working on a support case earlier this year with a client who was on an older version. And one of the pain points that they were having is the they have multiple warehouses and they will have a customer that will place a sales order that is getting satisfied or fulfilled from multiple warehouses. Now, I'm just going to go back into my sales here. If I needed to, I could actually create a new sales order here, right? So I could create a new sales order here, or I'm just going to go back into my sales order window here, and I'm just going to go into my sales transaction entry window. When I pick up a sales order, or if I create a new sales order here, so I'm just going to create a new sales order to... You know, Mr. Aaron Fitz, right? 
And when I tab through here, I can just start adding different line items. All right, so on here, we've also made one of the required fields is PO number, so this is the customer PO, and I'm just gonna throw this in my sample batch here. And if I add different line items, so 400 processor here, and what I'm gonna do here, I've got a little feature turned on to see additional notes. So I'm just gonna say each is here, and I've also got Omni price. I'm just gonna override short, it's just a Say, yeah, I don't care, so 1250 bucks for this. And this is coming out of one warehouse here. And if I wanted to, um, on my next line, I can always say, all right, so I want to also satisfy some 400 processors, right? Should I pick something that doesn't have so many notes? Scott, you're supposed to make sure I'm kept on track here, so I'm not picking things that don't have so many little exceptions on it. But You got time, so. <laughs> So as I go here for my site ID, I've moved my site up just into the header here. So I'm going to say that, you know what, I've got 2,100 of these in my north site. So I'm just going to say, all right, I want to satisfy, uh, sell one of these out of my warehouse, one of these out of my north site. I could probably set up pricing for this just to make it a little easier on what's coming out. But when I generate my pick slip or my packing slip here, um, when I click on the actions uh, or sorry, when I click on the print button here and I hit save here, what it's going to do is say, all right, what do you want to print? I can print my picking slip and my packing slip. Well, I can actually print separate packing and picking slips per site. And what it's going to do now is not only be able to print the separate picking slips and packing slips per site, but what it's going to do is it's going to actually give me the default. So I'm not going to actually print a packing slip. I'll just do it as picking just to show you. It's going to default for my template. So the fact that I have it being rendered as a template gives me the ability now to also email them. And more so, you can see here, this is a non-modified template. So it's saying, here's my north for one. And as I open this up, here's my warehouse for the other. So now I have the ability to print separate picking slips and packing slips per site, but it's also running it into a template. So I would be able to email those out. So that's a great little feature there. Um, and it's just enhancing on that emailing functionality, but more so specific to the sales order processing in the picking and packing uh, ticket templates. So that word template functionality. All right, if we're talking about printing and emailing, it's probably worthwhile jumping back onto my cash receipts. So there have been a number of requests uh, over the years to email cash receipts. Why would you want to email cash receipts? If you're issuing it as a receipt and sending it off to the customer to show that you received money, uh, if you wanted to send them a quick list of payments that you've received, stuff like that, easily enough you can now start printing or emailing your cash receipts. So if I go down into my transactions here, I'm just going to go get down into my cash receipts. So as I tab through my cash receipts here, I'm just going to put this in a sample batch again. right? And you know what, I might as well start paying some of the Aaron Fitz stuff. So when I select Aaron Fitz here and say I'm going to pay $1,500 or $15,000, easily enough, if I go into my apply here, you may not auto-apply when you're doing it, or you may. Auto-apply just simply says based my oldest, my newest, I'm just going to apply the balance that I got for that $15,000. And if I got a check number here, nine, do, 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 whatever that's, uh, payment number is, I can simply hit email from here. So the abil ability to be able to email out as a Word template uh, gives me the, abil or the ability that it has a Word template associated to it gives me the ability to email out. So I can email out my cash receipt. So I had successful there, so it wasn't an issue. should be getting that as an email because I sent it to myself just Actually, I should have set it up as like Andrew or Scott, just send it to somebody different. Um, but then that's one of the features, so the emailing of the cash receipts. So printing the cash receipts was an older feature. The emailing of the cash receipts is a new feature. But one of the other enhancements that they've added is the ability to update customers on a mass basis to allow the emailing of the cash receipts. So I'm just going to close out of here for a second. How does it know to email out the cash receipt? So when I go into my customer card here, I'm going to go back to that customer card. Now, you're going to notice Happy Ralphs is actually the first customer in my list, but when I do my lookup here, Happy Ralphs isn't in the list. Why is that? Well, I've excluded inactive customers. If I want to remove that check mark, I'll see all my customers. So that was a feature that was updated before. 
Um, so if you want to exclude them, just set it as your default view. So that's a nice little update that they've added. Um, so if I do a quick look up here and pick up Aaron Fitz again. Now under Aaron Fitz here, I will see that I have my email option. And under my email option, you can see cash receipts. Well, you know what, maybe I want to make that a PDF, so I'll change that. So that's great. Inside here, I have the ability to email out cash receipts. So that's how I got the email button up at the top. So I've got a Word template that's tied in. I have the ability to email out cash receipts. But more so, that's, you know, it's one of those scenarios where it's like, oh, it's great that it does this, but Marvin, I need to apply this to the thousand customers that I have. I don't want to go through this one at a time. So easily enough, what you could do is if I go back to that navigation list, right? So if I just go up to my customer's navigation list, so I'm just going to click on this. You see without my little uh, analyzer mode on over on the right-hand side, came up pretty quick. If I needed to update a customer, I can easily just pick up the customer here. I can say, update my email settings here and say, I want to do cash receipts. This is the message ID that I'm sending out, and I want it PDF. See right there, it was successful. If I need to do all my customers, just click on the header for the customer name here. It's going to mark off everything. And then when I go under my email settings here, go cash receipts, PDF, and go OK. So you're going to see that it actually ran through 117 of them within a second or two. Now, if you have 1,000 of them, it's going to take a minute or two. So be patient, but at the same time, it's certainly a lot quicker and a lot faster than having to uh, click on each one of them individually. All right, now that we're still in on the customer side, I'm just going to go back into my sales. Another one of the enhancements that have come in is the ability to uh, send out your final notice collection letter. So if you are using the collection letters, uh, great. When I click on my customer here, I can either click on write letters, there's a utility as well. I find a lot of people just go in here and write letters. Or if you wanted to get down to a specific customer, you can choose that customer and then write a letter. Now, if I just go write letters here, I'm going to go prepare collection letter. Under this, it's going to say, all right, you want to do a collection letter. Well, who do you want to do it for? All right, I have the ability to say a range of customers, a range of customer IDs or names, or a smart list selection. Okay, so this smart list selection was added a little while ago. The final emailing of the final customer letter or collection notice is what the enhancement is, but I always wanted to touch on this because if I had a smart list selection here, I can say, well, it's customer's balance or something like that, right? So when I pick this and go next, it's going to go through here. And What do you want to do? I want to do my final notice letter. Based on your smart list criteria, these are all the customers that were selected. I'm just going to unmark them. I'll just pick one. But think about it, if you built a smart list that says, these are the ones that I want to focus on, and I need to send out a letter for this reason, or a final collection notice because you've got customers with bad debt and stuff like that, this is a quick and easy way of building it out. And then you can say, you know, who's sending this, Marvin, the collections man, so on and so forth. And when you hit finish here, it's going to build out a unique letter for each one of these, and you should be able to see that a Word template has come out. So on this collection letter, you can actually design it so it says here's the invoice, the date, the numbers, and everything that's outstanding. You can also uh, update it, and you can find you know these uh, you know basically put the verbiage and wording around it. If you needed to update this collection letter, it's a Word template, so uh, you'll have a couple of different ways that you can do it. You can either do it through one of the utilities in the system, or if you know where the collection letter is stored, typically your collection letters are going to be stored. Um, mine. You can set in your DexINI file, and in mine, I actually set them under my data folder, under my letters, and then you can see here my collection letter, double click Marvin, final notice. I would actually be able to go into the final notice, and you'll see that I'm using my final notice DOCX template, so I'd use this one, and I would update that template. That gives you the ability to update it to be the wording you want. You can also create additional ones when you drop them in here. They are going to be the letters that show up in that list. So you can either use one of the template letters, or you could create your own custom letter. But what you do have the ability now is to generate a Word template for that final uh, letter. Alrighty, so I think I'm doing okay for time, Scott, because Scott hasn't uh, jumped on me yet for... Um, you had one more minute. You got 10 minutes left. I got 10 minutes left. Okay, well, I no, got a couple no. more things. We, we all have right. 10 minutes left. You have five. We all, 
I have five minutes left. Okay, well, I'll make sure that I get through the ones that I want to touch on here. Um, my next one that I want to touch on is document attachments. Now, as I went through the list and saw, you know what, the enhancement that came out is the ability to completely delete a document attachment. That's great because I do know there are a number of clients that use the document attachments, but I know there's a number of clients that aren't. So I thought, you know what, this is going to be a really good one to talk about because it's going to, A, talk about an enhancement that happened before, but an enhancement that's been added to this functionality. So the document attachments is basically where Microsoft has gone and they've created this attach, this paper clip on top of a customer. So when you click on this, you can see that I have the ability to create an attachment. Now, if you do not have this paper clip on your, I'll call it document for lack of a better term. So in this case, I'm looking at the customer master records, but if I was looking at sales orders or purchase orders or inventory items, so maybe you wanna do a certificate of conformance or you have a contract with a customer that you wanna to attach to the customer, you can do that now. Um, if I go through and the document attachment thing, not new, it's been around for a number of versions, but the completely delete is new. I'm just going to touch on how I set up the document attachment first. So first under the company here, I'm going to go document attachment setup. Turn this on. That's all there is to it. You can set some default locations. You can also say after I've attached it to a customer because it's going to embed it in the database after it brings it in, you can delete it off the network drive or the, the location that you uh, attach from where you can say you don't want to. But I can also tell that, you know, whether I'm going to allow deletions or not allow deletions. I can put a password on it. Um, and I can also identify whether I want these to flow. Flow means if I'm going to issue a sales order to a customer, I can take the documents that are attached to either the customer or the item and have those flow through to the sales order and send them off to the customer, as well as send attachment and email. So if you want them to flow and you want them to go to an email to the customer, just turn this on. It's really that easy. So when I get to the customer here and I want to click on attachment, this is where I have the ability to go, all right, Marvin, I got a file folder here with some pictures in it and maybe I have a client contract. So I'm going to go under the attach here and I'm just going to go client contract. Oh, that's the client contract to view. So let me just go back into the attach here, client contract, fantastic. If I needed to, I could hit preview here. Great. Oh, that's a billing invoice. Somebody labeled it wrong. Well, if I wanted to delete it and I've enabled the deletes, I can just simply hit delete row here and that's going to delete it. In the past, what it did was it took it out of the active and left it in the deleted, but it's still embedded in the database, so it was still sticking around. So one of the pain points people had was, when I delete something, I want it gone. Why are you leaving it in the deleted? So easily enough, what they've done is they've added this delete function. So even after you've deleted out of the active, you still have the ability to completely delete it. So now what that's done is it's removed it all together from the doc or from the master record. So again, on the customer, if I take a look here under sales, sales transaction entry, you're gonna see that I have documents that it could be attached here, or if I've set it to flow and I have something on the item, or if I have something on the customer, those would actually flow forward with that transaction that I was doing. Alrighty, so. Email reprint vendor remittance with message fields. So in the past, what would end up happening is if I was doing a payment run, for example, so if I'm under purchasing here and I was going to be doing a payment run to the supplier, right? So if I just go under here and I'm just gonna do a quick payment run to the supplier and I go edit payment batch, right? So I'm just gonna go got a sample batch. I'm just gonna add this batch here. Typically you would do a remittance advice with an EFT, Right, so in this case, I'm just going to do it on general payable. And if I pick, for example, uh, advanced office systems or a travel company here, I want to pay this $10,000 invoice. Right, so I'm going to hit print payments here. I'm going to do a separate remittance advice. So as I go through here and I go print, so I'm just going to print off the check, right? So check the stub on top bottom. Great, I'm just going to print that off. Yep, perfect. And I'm going to go process. So what that's going to do is bring me into this remittance. So if I wanted to email, in the past, it would send out an email with only the remittance, none of the verbiage around it or anything along those lines. So what would end up happening is you would typically just see, let me just go like this, and this is what the email would look like. Let me just pop that open. So you're just seeing an email, 
and it's just a straight old remittance advice, nothing else attached to it. But now when I actually hit process here and I do my remittance advice, uh, separate remittance, sure, I'll go to screen there, exception report, sure, I'll just go to screen there. On my remittance advice, oh, actually, I didn't need to print that off on a separate screen, and it was sent successfully. What ends up happening is now you're seeing dear partner, or dear vendor, or dear, you can actually put the words around it, so it's going to actually bring that in. Probably should have spent a little bit more time formatting this, but it's actually going to bring in all that verbiage around plus the remittance advice. So it's not just sending out the remittance advice anymore, but it's bringing out all the verbiage around the um, document uh, that you've set up, so the document ID that you've set up for it. All righty. So that's on the print separate remittance advice. Got time for one more, Marvin. I got time for one more. Okay, so this one I'm going to take, and uh, this one's the shared mailbox with multi-factor authentication. Okay, so I touched on the multi-factor authentication. You saw me, I had to punch in that number to get you know, my email to work, so it does work with multi-factor authentication. One of the common questions, though, when we're talking to clients is, when I'm sending out my customer statements, or when I'm sending out my vendor remittance advices, or whatever it is that I'm sending out, I want it to go from a shared mailbox. I don't want it to go from my mailbox. So in the past, you could have the reply sent to, or you could always log in as that other user, or like if it was the shared mailbox, you could log in uh, if it was set to exchange. But now what they've done is if I go under the setup here, so tool setup, if I go under sales or purchasing, so it's going to be available in both of them, I can go under my email settings here. You now see I have the ability to say shared mailbox. So maybe this is ap at endeavorsolutions.com. So if I use shared mailbox, oh, I'll just go OK here, and I can say, sorry, ap at endeavorsolutions.com. Uh, and then uh, just go into your vendor setup. It's going to bring you into that setup window like we had with the uh, navigation list. And I can say I want to apply it across multiples. So I can say click multiples and then just go in here and just go into my email settings so that I've updated whichever vendors I need to or all the vendors. So you can say, you know, use my share, shared mailbox settings for when they're coming out. So, ooh, Scott, I think that was, I actually think I hit every one of the points that I wanted to because the last one I was going to hit was modern authentication, but I actually hit that first when I logged in and it asked me to sign in with uh, my credentials and use my uh, modern factor authentication on that for my MFA. Perfect. So uh, I'll take over the screen. Thank you very much, Marvin. And just for you, yay, there's your round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Uh, for it. Uh, much appreciated. Really uh, having that extra insights and uh, clearly seeing you know the extra efforts you put in through uh, preparing for today. Uh, thank you for that. So for those that are staying on Dynamics GP, we have a great white paper written by the team. Uh, talks about some of the popular invest investments: uh, the e-commerce and self-serve portals, PO requisition automation, AP invoice automation. Advanced dashboards, cloud reporting, all the budgeting, uh, as well as email communications uh, is one of the tips of the six. So if you want a copy of it, free to download, just click on it. Um, you don't have to type in your information. You can do it secretly, share it with your friends, family, you name it. Uh, so six tips of, uh, for digital transformation while staying on Dynamics GP. For those that are looking at uh, the other side of the fence, we have on the Endeavor Solutions website over on the right-hand side, do you want to move from GP to Business Central? And uh, we have a white paper that also talks about the values of the cloud. Uh, you can compare why would I want to stay versus why I want to go. If you want to take a step further, Endeavor can help you out. We have a number of options for assessments uh, as well as account reviews and we even have some funding from Microsoft to discount those assessments uh, for you. So for those that are new with Endeavor we have one minute left. Uh, now I've been around for 35 years over 900 clients coast to coast across Canada and the US continuing to win awards and continuing to have three brands Endeavor, GP Support North for all the people using Dynamics GP, which we love, as well as purely CRM, uh, representing our extremely large and strong uh, CRM team. 
three lines of business, advisory services, implementations, upgrades, and then on ongoing optimization and support. Our core values of integrity, trust, and accountability uh, really do ring true across all of our consultants and our dedication to you as our clients. So next steps, as discussed, uh, reach out to the support desk, reply to the webinar email, find us online, uh, connect to support or to Steve or others on our team. And as I mentioned, uh, annual account reviews uh, is something that we haven't done for a while. And given our growth, we have uh, additional headcount that are freeing up some time to do uh, account reviews with you. So should you stay, should you go, what should your roadmap look like for the next three to five years or longer? How can you get more out of your existing applications? These are discussion points that you can have uh, with our team. And as I mentioned, uh, there are assessments that we can do. Uh, and that includes what is the cost to migrate? If I want to stay or go, if I want to justify staying, I probably show that I've kicked some tires and say, here is the cost for moving. If I do want to move, here are some costs to be budgeting and be looking at uh, for the future. As I mentioned earlier on, we had a great client survey. We're going to do another one uh, this spring, so please look at it for it. Participating in the client survey helps your voice be heard, helps shape uh, Endeavor's direction, uh, and making sure that we are allocating uh, the staff to help you. Uh, one of the things that came out was an interest in additional assessments and, and account reviews. Now we are providing it to you. So make sure your voice is heard, talk to support, talk to your consultants, um, talk to us, and well, that survey uh, helps out as well. So we're one minute over the hour. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Um, Marvin, do you have five minutes if anyone wanted to ask a quick question? Uh, I have a couple minutes, but uh, I do have another call to jump on to. But yeah, if anyone has a quick question, okay. go right ahead. Within the GoToWebinar, uh, there is a question and chat feature. Uh, you can type some stuff in. Uh, right now, I don't see any. And yes, of course, as always, if you, do, if you do have uh, uh, questions and they come to you afterwards, send them through. That, that's good also. Thanks, Marvin. Let's, uh, let's wrap this up. Oh, there is one. Oh, it's a hand raise. I'm not sure how to do the hand raising thing, so uh, we'll have to uh, skip that. Uh, please, you know, again, reach out and uh, either type in your question or uh, you know where to find us online, www.endeavorsolutions.ca or .com, as well as www.gpsupportnorth.com. The GP Support North is where we keep uh, most of our Dynamics GP information and uh, free training webinar recordings. Okay, everyone, have a wonderful day. Thank you very much for your time. And Thanks, everyone. Look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Bye for now. Thanks, Scott, for inviting me. Thanks, Marvin.